everybody and uh looks like we're going good so this is a very impromptu live video about basically a bunch of questions i've been seeing over and over again from people who have maybe bought some astronomy gear over christmas and now that the weather is starting to warm up it's starting to say okay how do i necessarily use this gear what gear should i have bought um what else do i might need all that great content and i was like all right let's do this so i have jumped in here because I went on my other channel, edited like 20 videos yesterday, and I'm like not doing that today. <laughs> so live, we're doing this live and hopefully everything is working great. If you are catching us on the replay, um, feel free to leave your questions below in the comment section and I will get to answering those questions as soon as possible. If you're jumping in here on the live show, uh, feel free to, I guess it's probably this side, this side over here to, uh, you know, ask questions and I will see them come up and I will answer those in addition to some of the other questions that I've gotten. So without further ado, let's jump into the questions. So number one is, do I need a telescope to start doing astronomy? And the reality is, no, you don't. What you need to do is have some decently dark skies, no clouds, <laughs> that's always an important one, and be able to see. Now, obviously optics aids help a lot. So if you're just starting and you don't necessarily want to buy yourself a whole telescope, you can get a pair of binoculars. Now, these can be like birding binoculars. There's also astronomy binoculars. But basically, binoculars will allow you to see some of the bigger objects up in the sky. Things like the Andromeda Galaxy, things like the, oh, shoot, what's that big one called? Orion Galaxy. By the way, um, Andromeda Galaxy is behind me here, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. And... That's sort of where we're at um, starting off, is that you don't really need a lot of gear. And if you are looking at spending money, you don't have to go out and buy the latest and greatest to get a really good value. Um, one thing I always tell people when they're saying, I want to start doing astronomy, not astrophotography, just need to put that out there, astronomy, not astrophotography, is basically looking at, okay, buy yourself a Dobsonian telescope. It's basically a big reflector on what's called a Dobsonian mount. It sits on the ground and it's quite good. And I am going to pop over here if I can remember how to do it. There we go, okay. So I'm just jumping onto Focus Scientific's uh, website. They have a whole new website. I actually haven't seen this before, <laughs> geez. Um, and we're just gonna go down here and jump down to, well, I was hoping telescopes. I'm hoping this works, there we go, okay. so. This is a Dobsonian telescope. And basically, this is the Dobsonian mount right here. I don't remember to do it here. There we go. And basically, it's an alt as mount that's low on the ground. You can look up here. The best thing about these is that they are a lot of aperture for not a lot of money. There's a lot of, this one happens to be completely manual, but you're getting an eight inch scope for $600. It's, I'm not trying to sell products here in this video. I'm just saying, if you're starting off, and you're looking at just doing astronomy, this is the one you want to go with. If you're looking at getting a little bit more serious, um, a go-to is generally a good idea. Uh, I actually bought one of these. This is um, the Celestron Nexstar SE8. There's a bunch of different versions. There's a newer one. Um, I don't know what they call it. I think it's Evolution Series. But this is sort of the step up where you have it where the controller on the side here um, basically runs this fork mount. It's alt as. And you can get it where you can put a wedge in here for astrophotography, but this is mainly a visual thing. Um, you can see here that the price increases um, quite a bit. Uh, basically, all this go-to technology, et cetera, basically you're tossing an extra $1,000 in. That's why when I tell people if they're starting off, get the daub. If you're not going to take it out and look at the night sky and feel I've got $600 worth of value, which you can always resell for a decent price, which I'll talk about later, Reality is that to jump up to something automated with go-to, et cetera, it, it gets pricey very quickly. Um, this is not a inexpensive hobby, although, as I said later, I will give you some insights on how to be a little bit more frugal. I'll pop back here. There's also like these little guys here. <clears throat> these guys are kind of neat. Um, this is great for if you have small kids uh, and you live in, say, uh, the suburbs where you don't have a lot of light pollution. We're still going to have some, but not as much as, say, a downtown core city. This is great for getting kids interested in astronomy. It's a good way to say, is the kid going to actually go out and look at night or stuff? Or is it this concept of, I want to do it, but I don't. It also happens to be, since it's tabletop, 
a little easier to uh, store. So if you have small kids, that's always an interesting idea. And what else do we have here? Yeah, this this website's like all the stuff that I've bought <laughs> right here. Um, then you're getting into uh, telescopes that are a little bit more, um, I don't want to say pricey, but it depends on where you're going. Now, if you're going with astrophotography, these things here, they're great for like planetary because planetary, very short focal lengths. Um, some of them work a little bit better than others. I'll, I think everyone here knows if you're on my channel, I own a red cat. I use it for my primary wide field imaging. And then I have the Celestron eight inch for, uh, when I want to target smaller objects. But for right now, um, I'm going to skip talking about that one and I'm going to see if I can find something else. Um, yeah, so we're going to scroll down. Yeah, there's a lot of telescopes. Yeah, so here's the upgraded Nexstar Evolution. So it's got a bunch of uh, advanced features. I don't know them all. I'm not an astronomy telescope salesperson. So, <laughs> but it's it's better than the orange one. But again, there's a there's a price jump. Um, oh, that's because it also yeah it's a, they they apparently mount an Edge HD onto that. Yeah, that would that that would explain the price difference right there. Um, but what I want to find is more of our classical all right there we go so i don't know if i can make this bigger i can kind of make it bigger okay so this is more of a classical telescope where you have a uh, german equatorial mount so the telescope actually uh rotates on this axis here um to track the sky and then on uh, it's harder to show here the deck axis to basically target the sky and these guys here can come with go to. You can set them up with uh, guide cameras and everything else. And you can actually use these for astrophotography. And realistically, if you're just going to do regular astronomy, I would say Alt As or Alt As with go to or Dobsonian is all you really need. If you're starting to talk about astrophotography, I would say jump into a German equatorial mount or star tracker as fast as possible. And I wonder do they have star trackers on this website? <laughs> Probably. I just have to figure out where it is. Uh, let's see. I'm almost certain they have it. Boom, there we go. So star trackers. So yeah, if you're wanting to start in astrophotography, the German equatorial mounts are definitely the way to go. But the reality is here that you definitely want to go with a star tracker to start. And the reason I say this is, is if you're coming from Astronomy, go for the German equatorial mount. If you're just starting out, go for the star tracker. And the sole reason for that is because this hobby, when you're doing astrophotography, is a lot of standing out in the cold weather. And I've seen a lot of people spend thousands of dollars on gear that they then decide they don't like doing this hobby anymore or whatnot. And they're like, what am I gonna do with this telescope? And it sits in their house unused for years. Whereas if you get a star tracker, it's a lot more affordable. It gets you a good foot in the door. Um, it allows you to use things like telescope lenses and all that good stuff. So you're not putting in a huge cost-effective uh, sink. But at the same time, you're like, yeah, if you don't like this hobby, selling something that's only, you know, four, five, six hundred dollars once you get all like the different things, it's not a big problem you know if you buy something for six hundred dollars and you turn around and sell it for five hundred dollars well the hundred dollars is the enjoyment you hopefully got out of it and you can go on your merry way whereas if you go and buy something that's like two three four thousand dollars when you go to sell it you know for say a thousand dollars less that's a big chunk of money so just something to keep in mind if you are starting astrophotography right away um that's something to do hey i'm gonna pronounce this probably is, is it alex without an e hi welcome alex without an e um, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just, just leave them in the comments below. Uh, so I really like this website. And this is partly, I guess, the way it seems to be laid out. It seems to work well. So I've seen a lot of people, they buy these uh, star trackers. And they generally come like this. They'll have the, the mount that comes with the camera. They'll have the deck plate, the counterweight. And this is the uh, dovetail thing that they use to mount like your camera or something like that. If you have a telescope, it'll come with a Vixen dove plate. So you'll actually use that instead of this guy here. And you can do that. But if we go back here for one second, these from William Optics are um, the base mounts for the star trackers. I'm going to tell you right now that they are a lot better than what comes with the, the uh, star trackers. Now, this is the 
Star Adventurer. There's also Optron Star Guider. Um, and then there's the small version. And then there's a large version. Similarly, Optron has the same idea. But here's the thing. All the Star Guiders have these basic mounts. They're like $90 mount. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is what you want. You definitely want to go and get the uh, William Optics version. And I think they come with an extra one. This one here, yeah. So this is with the, sky, the guider. And this one here is for the Star Tracker. So depending on which one you want. Are they just extra bars? Yeah, they're extra bars. Cool. So yeah, um, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but this allows you to have a lot better stability. You will want to put it on a tripod that has at least a one inch um, center bar, if not two inch center bar. Um, the extra weight of the tripod is going to keep things from being blown around in the wind or knocked over or shaking. But yeah, if you're starting in astrophotography, photography, and you haven't done astronomy before, so you're not sure if you're going to actually follow up with the hobby, star adventures, star guiders, uh, little star trackers like this are great. Just, you know, plug in the money. So you're looking at 580. Oh, this is Canadian dollars. I should probably mention this is a Canadian site. I'm in Canada. So yeah. Um, and then you're doing this. So, it's, you know, you're talking about $700. Then you basically toss on your camera, um, a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera. Uh, you can also do it with your cell phone. But cell phones, even the newest ones, they can do an okay job. But the reality is that, yeah, you, you're going to want to get a actual camera of some sort. And if you do decide to go with the, oh, shoot, what's it called? Uh, Astro camera and set up like that. Yeah, uh, these work great for carrying them and all that stuff. Just realize that you, you, I don't know why you'd buy a star, star guider and then go out and buy a dedicated astro camera. Because again, as I said before, you're sort of putting two feet into a hobby um, before you've had the chance from a beginner standpoint. Um, I do know that this, this lens here is amazing <laughs> and you can use it. Um, the William Optics Red Cap 51. You can use it on... And I believe you can get away with up to about 61 millimeter telescope, a small refractor, uh, before it starts to get a little too overweighted. You can also go and one second here. Uh, have it behind here. Total pre planning, but you can also use something like this a telephoto lens and your camera. This is again about as much weight as you're going to want to put on a Star Guider. And such like this. Uh, one second, Alex, I will answer that. So Alex has asked in the question, and we'll just jump quickly to this, is experience with remote observatories. So this is another option if you're just beginning. You can actually go and rent some space on remote observatories. Now, there are a couple different companies that do that. And if I... Do a quick little Google here. I know of one, RASC, the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada. If you're a member there, they do have a new remote telescope that they have, robotic telescope, I believe is what they call it. There you go. Yeah. So they have it, and you can actually go and you can buy time on remote telescopes. Now, depending on where they are, a lot of them are going to be located in like Chile. <laughs> um, some of them are located in Arizona. This one here, I believe, is in California. So they're located in places that don't have a lot of clouds, tend to be either higher elevation uh, or, in the case of California, just no clouds. And you're actually able to rent them. And there's a couple different ways they do it. Some of them have it where you basically rent by saying, I want the telescope to do this. And somebody will control the telescope, get you the data, and then they literally will send you an email. And then there are some more advanced programs out there where you basically get control of the telescope and you can basically run it for your system. Um, depends on, again, what they are. My experience with them is I've seen people who've used them. I know a couple of people who own remote telescopes. Uh, I personally haven't used a lot because I have my own little observatory up the hill. But you can use uh, these if you want to start and get like a photo. Um, they're, they're great for astrophotography. They're great for scientific research. But the big benefit that they present is that you can go to say, I want two, three hours of imaging on something or other, maybe in another hemisphere that you don't live in. 
And it's cost effective than having to go out and either a travel to that location or to image, um, buy all this gear yourself and take the image. The one cravat to that is that renting on a remote telescope is like a good analogy. A good analogy is this. It's like owning your own airplane and flying. Uh, like if you're ultra rich and you own your own airplane, if you're using it all the time, it becomes very cost effective. The other cost effective way of doing it is buying a first class ticket on a commercial airline. Now, if you're just doing it the one or two times, it makes sense to buy that first class ticket, then buy your own airplane. And the same thing with the remote telescopes. This is like a 16 inch telescope. It's got all the fancy tech technology cameras, et cetera, on it. You're basically paying to use that from a rental standpoint. So it's much cheaper than say buying your own telescope. But if you're gonna use it a lot, it gets really expensive really quickly. So I hope that answers your question, Alex, without an E. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you can do it. Um, Rask has one. Uh, I know they've been rolling it out and they are, I think there's a page that you can get to tells you how to actually contact them and book time on the telescope. But the idea being here is that remote telescopes are great if you have a specific target. And I generally say in the other hemisphere. So if I wanted to image the, the small or large Mangelic clouds, I live in the Northern hemisphere. The only way I'm going to do that is if I travel down to the equator or even lower and I'm doing a cost estimation between all that flight time costs, et cetera, for travel versus renting a telescope that's already in that location and collecting that data. So it's sort of an interesting thing to do. Uh, I definitely am going to potentially do that one day uh, for a particular target if I find that I'm not able to get down there. But overall, I'm going to say that Remote telescopes are great, um, but definitely shop around. There are definitely a lot of different choices out there. I just know for but being up in Canada, this is the big one that's been promoted to us recently. All right, so we're going to hop back. I was over on this page here. Yeah, if you're in America, OPT Telescope is, I think, your biggest uh, astronomy store uh, location. Um, they don't have a physical address anymore or a physical store that you can go into unlike uh, Focus Scientific, but uh, you can order a lot of stuff online from them. And I will probably put an affiliate link later. Um, in Canada, Ontario Telescopes and Accessories, um, definitely I would put a recommendation for them. Steve is pretty good at getting stuff and he keeps it since he's completely online. Uh, you can contact him, phone him, et cetera, and he can tell you if he has stock. Um, and obviously his website has stock if it says it has stock or not but uh, it seems to be pretty good. And for walk-in and talking stuff, Tristan over at Focus Scientific uh, does a very good job as well. Uh, and I've bought a lot of stuff from them because I originally was living in Ottawa before I moved out in the middle of nowhere so I could get darker skies. <laughs> so that's what we get for there. Um, so uh, yes, that's what I think I'm going to talk about. I don't want to see if I can pull up. Light pollution, come on, there we go. So this is the other thing I want to talk to people about and didn't totally preload, um, is a light pollution map. So this is actually called lightpollutionmap.info. And basically, if we go through here, this gives you an idea of where dark skies are. Now, this is important because about, I think 80% of the population lives in light pollution skies. So looking at something like a fil uh, sky pollution filter or light pollution filter, or like a L Pro, L Enhanced, L Extreme, um, a triad filter, quad band filter might be needed if you're in one of these red or white hotspots. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of them, especially over here in North America. If we go to say, um, other countries here, you can see basically it's population hotspots. Um, and for our, oops, I guess I have to go the other way. Friends on the other side of the world, Australia. Um, and I can't get New Zealand. Oh, come on. <laughs> that, I would like to apologize to New Zealand for the fact that there's an ad over, I don't know how to get rid of the ad that sits over top of your country. <laughs> I, I can scroll in. I can scroll in to get get to get New Zealand in here. But yeah, um, <laughs> New Zealand, 
2021 global CIO report. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is actually quite useful because you definitely want to know depending where you live. And I know when I lived in Ottawa, we go here. Um, yeah, so I, I used to live in Ottawa um, over here in Canada. And basically, it it's a pretty bad light pollution zone. Um, so what I actually ended up doing was uh, the local astronomy group actually had a uh, little piece of property that we could go and image. And it was over here in Mississippi Mills. So I actually drive the 45 minutes all the way out here to sort of get the darker skies. And some of my earlier photography worked pretty well for that. So if you're starting in astrophotography or astronomy, um, basically uh, the second big tip I'm going to tell you is have a look at this map and see how far do you have to drive to get darker skies? Because I know a lot of people who will get astronomy stuff and they'll be located like in a hot bubble like this. And what they don't realize is that their life would be so much easier if they got up and drove out here and parked in a parking lot, or maybe they know somebody who lives out in the middle of nowhere that will let them use their property. Um, maybe stop at a park. Um, and again, you can check the local laws, rules, etc. And also your, um, oh shoot, local astronomy group will have some, generally have some spots that they've gotten permission for. I know like there's one spot, the exact location on this map is hard to tell, but there's a lot of dark spots over here. And I know that all the astronomy groups out here, we actually have permission to go out to a couple different spots out here in this Bortle 1 zone. I know over here, um, where will I find it? To Kaladar. So right about here is a dark sky viewing area. And then there's another one that's just north of this park somewhere. Somewhere here. Somewhere over here. <laughs> um, which is the uh, dark sky viewing area for North Frontenac. So those are two dark sky zones um, that are, you know, they're within an hour drive. But... Yeah, so definitely check out this map because if you're doing it from your backyard, it works quite well. But especially for people who are like, yeah, you can kind of forget this part of the world. But yeah, if you live in a city, check out this map and see how far you have to drive to get a dark sky zone. Because getting to a dark sky is definitely helps your um, visual astronomy by a lot. But if you're doing astrophotography, Again, you can buy some very expensive, I think they're called triad filters. I know there's Opsilon ones as well. Yeah, like a two inch triad filters, a thousand, this is US dollars, a thousand US dollars. It's, you know, amazing and it does a really good job. But if you can drive half an hour when you're doing astronomy and get darker skies, you're going to get a better result. And you can take that money, that thousand dollars you would normally spend and put it towards some gas and, you know, maybe a night out or something like that if you're going to go out to uh, like a long weekend or something to do some astronomy or go to a star party star parties are lots of fun when we used to have them we will have them again so what else have we got here for starting so yeah binoculars are always a good one i think i'll see if i can find the binoculars do we have them binoculars yeah so there's binoculars and again binoculars you know this is this Lestron Skymaster. It's like $130. This is Canadian dollars. So it's probably like a hundred bucks US. Um, and then, uh, yeah, these are the ones I want. <laughs> Why do I want them? No particular reason. They're just big giant binoculars, but they have the little stand and everything. Cause I've, I've thought about these for outreach would be kind of neat to have. Cause I think there's a lot of people you hand them a pair of binoculars or you have it on a stand. They know how to use binoculars without touching the eyepieces. Whereas when you're trying to show telescopes, everyone's like, oh, I, I seem to have to touch the eyepiece. Uh, <laughs> which is why, and I think I have zoom eyepiece. All right, cool, this one works. So it's not the this is not the one I have, but they're zoom eyepieces. They're relatively inexpensive. They give a good view. This is what I use for outreach just simply because if somebody's going to go touchy, touch, 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 touch here, I'm less angry than um, if they go on my, dare I ask how much this is new, come up. Oh, there's apparently a lot of stuff here. All right. Apparently, I don't even know what the name of that is. But yeah, no, like my, my visual eyepieces are expensive. I don't want people touching them. I don't want to be touching them. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, so that just gives you an idea of some of the things that you can do. Uh, let's go. Next question on my list. All right. So we're going to pop back to me for a second here. All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about getting into astrophotography beyond just taking the photos. I want to talk to you a little bit about software. Now, there's a couple different things for software that you need to know. There's free software and free software is surprisingly amazing, mostly PC based, although there are a couple um, Mac and uh, Linux options. But the recent one I've seen come up and I did a video, which I should link somewhere up here to show you is called Affinity Photo. And the reason for it is because they've actually come up with a way to do all the main stacking processes, so your darks, your lights, all that stuff like that in one step. And while it's not necessarily as good as say Pixinsight, <laughs> um, Affinity Photo is a lot cheaper than Pixinsight. It's a lot cheaper than Photoshop and it's definitely a lot cheaper than uh, um, pretty much everything else that's not free, like Deep Sky Stacker and stuff. So you're gonna definitely wanna check that out. But this is the other side of why I say to people, you know, when you're looking at doing astrophotography, um, you want to buy that less expensive gear is because the next step to astrophotography is the skill. And the skill is making sure that you can get round stars, you can get your auto, um, you can get your polar alignment. Maybe you're going to buy an auto guider camera system and stuff like that, but it's processing. Cause I've done like a couple videos on some of the longer, um, I did one video and I'll post that up here, you know, over here where it says, powered by StreamYards, I'm using the wrong hand. Here, post up here, is that uh, basically processing these photos takes a long time. Like, I think I spent five to six hours processing the photo you see behind me here. <laughs> I'm not joking, I'm not making this up, and I've done it three times now with three different pieces of software to sort of see how they present themselves. And I'm going to pull that up. Here we go. I'm not going to pull it up with the. Ah, uh, we'll grab this one. There we go. And boom. Oh, what I do? There we go. So the photo behind me. This is what it looks like, and I could probably make it full screen. There you go. So this photo took me about five and a half to six hours to do all the processing steps, and I'll have a link below to the video for that as well, and I'll post it up here. But the big thing I, I say to people when they're starting astrophotography is, yeah, it's an afternoon, it's a whole evening. Sometimes it can be a whole day uh, processing a photo. So it's not just the night that you spent uh, going out to get the imagery or two nights or three nights. It's actually to send the, all the processing time. And if I grab this one over here, this is, uh, grab this version. This is another, oh, uh, it's small make it bigger this is another example so this this one here um is three nights of effort so i went out and i imaged for three nights to get this data i then had to combine all this data and put together i took me i think a whole day to do that so when people see astrophotography images and stuff like that um, and they say i want to do that i'm like go for it but uh just realize that this takes a lot of time and it's a lot of nitty gritty time. And I see a lot of people who will want to jump into the hobby with two feet. I'm, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, know what you're getting into. So that's just sort of an idea there. And this, those two photos were processed with Pixinsight and I have, can I get, yeah, I can get it. So that was Pixinsight. Actually, you know what? Let's pop that up for a second. Ah, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. Am I? Yes, I can do it. Yeah, I'll hold that for a second. And we'll do Andromeda. And we're going to find Affinity Photo. And we're going to grab, where is it? I need to like put like final or like final, final or final, final, final on these things. Uh, let's go with this guy here. There we go. All right, so I'm going to go back to full screen here. I just want to show you this. So this is an infinity photo. I played around with it a little bit to get it. Um, and then this is PixInsight. So the same data. Can I go back and forth? No, I cannot easily. I don't know if there's another. Can I add another? 
No, that's screen share. Okay, cool. Learning how to do stuff. So I'm just going to pop between the two. So there's the same data. Um, the cropping was a little bit different. Um, but you can sort of see here that this was, like, as I said, about six, seven hours worth of effort. This was about three, three hours, I think, of effort, maybe a little less than that. Um, since I don't know how to use all the tools in Affinity Photo yet, um, but this was just to show sort of stacking. <clears throat> so just to give you an idea, like when I talk to people and they're like, I want to do this and all this cool stuff, I'm like, for with all the free software, you can get to this with a night's worth of imagery from a reasonably dark location. Uh, as long as you're getting round stars, it's not difficult to do. It will take some processing. But when I see people and they and they see pic pictures like this, I'm like, oh goodness, I have to buy a ton of gear and all this stuff. You, you don't. This stuff I took, I think I used the red cap for this one. Um, I think this is like the third or fourth, fourth image I took with the red cat. Um, I just have a basic German equatorial um, mount. It's a Lozman DGM8. I bought it used. And yeah, polar alignment is important, but... The big thing to go from the first picture to this one here is just uh, processing, learning all the processing steps, et cetera. You don't need to go out and buy a really, really, really expensive telescope to do this. I probably could have done this with the 300 millimeter lens. I could have probably done this with maybe a little bit smaller. If I do, can I make this smaller? Let me make it smaller. Come on. Uh, apparently it only makes me allows me to make it bigger. Great. But if I were to, let's see. I'll make this smaller. One second. There we go. So I could have probably done this with my 100 millimeter um, or 105 millimeter Nikon vintage lens. It's really amazing. Um, but obviously, the uh, ah shoot, word blanking here. But uh, yeah, the oh, shoot magnification. There you go. Wouldn't be as much. Hi, Ty. Welcome to the stream. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in chat. And within about 30 seconds delay, I will see them and I will try to answer your questions. And if you are watching and you aren't seeing anything in chat, thank you for watching so far. Feel free to leave a, a comment or question in chat and I will get to an answer. If you're watching this on the replay, leave your question below in the comment section and I will get to it later uh, when I see it. So yeah, so a lot of good imagery is a lot of processing, a lot of art, and these are done with like basically a one-shot color camera. Uh, I'm using my Nikon Z6, which is the other thing I want to talk to people about, which is affordability in astronomy and astrophotography. Yeah, affordability. There is some affordability in this hobby. All right, so we're going to pop over here. So obviously you can always buy something new. Um, new is always nice. And depends on what you get, you can get a lot of entry stuff new. But if we switch over here, there we go. You can also buy stuff used. And depending on where in the world you live, <laughs> how you do this is, is a little different. And I'm going to just pop up this one right here. So this is um, astrobicell.com. And I have bought a lot of stuff on astrobicell.com, which is the Canadian site. They also have um, astrobicell.com. Hang on. Yeah, there's the UK version. So if you live in the United Kingdom or if you live in Australia, and I think it's Australia's kind of New Zealand as well. Um, and that's .com slash AU and UK. You can actually go on here and buy uh, used gear. The other thing I like about it is that it gives you this whole section over here. These are astronomy stores that are likely local to you. So if you're wondering where should I buy equipment from, here's your answer. <laughs> Same thing here. Here's the Canadian ones here. And Australia apparently has none. Oh, no, they're over here on the side. All right. So there's some, some astronomy st stores you can buy stuff from. So buying used is pretty good. Um, you can buy stuff through uh, your local astronomy groups. Might have people who are trying to sell stuff as well. Um, or you can always put onto the group post or go to a meeting or something and say, hey, I'm in need of, you know, a optolong two-inch extreme. 
Do nobody saw this. Nobody saw this at all. Ignore it. I've been looking for one of these. So shh. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's one of those things where you can literally go and find the stuff without much difficulty. Um, if you're in the US, um, which a lot of you are, um, we go to, and now I'm going to remember what it's called. Shoot. It's called Cloudy Night Forums? Yeah, Cloudy Night Forums. And they have a classified section. So if you're in the United States, Cloudy Nights Forum Classifieds is basically your go-to spot uh, to get used astronomy gear. A bit of Canadian stuff leaks in here as well and a little bit from Mexico, but mainly this is U.S. stuff. And it has pretty much any type of gear you can think of. You're probably going to be able to find it here used. And the pricing tends to be reasonable. Everything obviously is negotiable when it's used gear. But anyone who overpriced their stuff, it'll sit on there. Anyone who's underpriced their stuff, it'll disappear like this. Make sure I'm on screen. <laughs> so, yeah, um, if you're buying used, this is sort of where you want to go. Now, obviously, you can use Craigslist, Kijiji, eBay, um, a bunch of other ones like that. However, I would say with those ones to err on the side of caution, like seriously caution here, because these are the groups that are amateur astronomers who are selling gear that they've used and anyone who sells like really garbagey gear or tries to pull a fast one people tend to pick it up pretty quick and it's a small community like i know there's a lot of astronomers out there but it's a very small community and as you sort of step up in sort of the price of gear that community gets exponentially smaller so buying it off of one of these sites here while it obviously is not risk-free and you do have to watch out for scams and other stuff like that the reality is buying you stuff this works very well versus say Kijiji or Craigslist of stuff. You can still find some good deals on there, but generally you're dealing with somebody who's, I'm going to say, not in the hobby in terms of like the hobby community. That's what I should say. Not not in the hobby. They're in the hobby, but they're not in the community. They're not necessarily part of the groups, not parent because everyone who's in astronomy, who knows anything, talks to anyone, and somebody says, hey, where can I buy some astronomy gear used, are going to point you to one of these four sites. Okay depending on where you, you live. Like, it's just simply, this is the people in the know know where to get their gear if they want to buy it used. Same thing if you're looking at buying it from a store. There's some stores that have great reputations and everyone's going to say, you're going to want to buy stuff from these stores. And then there's stores that we simply just don't talk about. <laughs> um, so, Ty... All right, so Ty's asked a question. He's, and I can pop that up on the screen. I don't know why I haven't been doing this. Boom, technology. <laughs> All right, so Ty's question is that he's looking at a red cat and pair it with a Canon uh, 5D Mark II. Absolutely nail polar alignment. And then even then I'm like, eh. so you're gonna definitely wanna get a, a guide camera. Uh, the guide camera, I would say, if you wanna start off with is a ZWO. And I'm gonna go over to here, I'm sure. I know. Yeah, he's got a holiday sale. Let's see where we got it. Yeah, here it is. This is the guide camera you want. Um, and then you can get a little guide scope with it, um, which I should probably see if I can find it. So it's the ASI 120mm. And sometimes there is a uh, ZWO guide scope. Oh. Work. All right, there's one here. Um, yeah, the other option here is you can get Alter as well. Yeah, this is the, the scope, not the camera, but you can get this as well. It's got little rings and stuff. This is what you need for the um, Red Cat. It doesn't have to be crazy, amazing, or anything like that uh, in order to guide effectively. It sits on top of the Red Cat. It's pretty easy to use. Um, So, um, yeah, like I would recommend you get a guide camera. Now, obviously you can take those short exposures, but I'm going to tell you right now that when you get to processing, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because being able to take 30 second subs or five minute subs, um, like those types of imaging lengths allow you to basically get 
processing like you know 20 30 maybe 100 photos you start talking about i took five second subs and <laughs> your computer's gonna want to kill you <laughs> uh i did that for one time because i had a guide ca the guide camera i was using it's still having some problems and i was like i just left the computer run for two hours so yeah um definitely go for guide scope you will save yourself hours in processing because you don't have less photos that you have to process So does it tie into the tracker? So yeah, so the guide camera plugs, so you're gonna need to plug it into a computer to guide, um, or you're gonna need like something like the ASI Air. This is why astrophotography gets really expensive really quickly. Um, I would generally recommend if you can plug it into a laptop um, to get PhD guiding, um, which I will pull up here. And if you have a laptop, just sit the laptop right beside it. This works great. This is what I use. Plug it right into the laptop and away you go. It literally stands for push here dummy. Um, it's not hard to use. If you want to use something like the ASI Air, which is its own onboard computer, and it does a whole pile of stuff, um, that's a great way to go. It's a little bit pricey because essentially you're buying a small box computer. Um, but it also is an option if you don't have a laptop. And... Yeah, so you're right now you're limited with your camera to one second subs with no tracking. Yeah, that that you, you definitely want to get a guide system. I know I spent two years fumbling around with a guide camera, and I had my friend tell me you should be getting a guide camera. I'm like, no, 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 I'm 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 good, I'm good. And he's like, I I, I think I was at a point where I was gonna like break the friendship. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, guide camera is definitely the uh, way to go. So if you can buy it, if you can afford it, I would go with the guide camera, just get a little guide scope. Again, if you can get them used, I think that you can generally get a guide scope used pretty easily. Um, a guide camera used is generally a little harder to get your hands on because they tend to last forever. And unless somebody's buying a newer, bigger guide camera, they don't tend to sell them very often. Yes, and Ty is absolutely right. Uh, Cloudy Nights does help uh, with some of the scammers and stuff because they actually do have a limit on what you can post and how often you can post. Because at the end of the day, unless you're selling everything in the hobby and you're saying, you know, I'm done walking out the door, and even then, chances are you're not going to be selling more than like two or three things at any one time anyway. So something to keep in mind, um, whereas Kijiji, um, eBay, and other stuff allows you to do that. Also, I should point out this, um, you're far less to buy uh, stolen gear or anything weird like that because these groups and stuff, this is where everyone's watching for the stuff. If somebody stole something and they're trying to sell it, they're watching those websites like a hawk. It ain't going to go anywhere. Um, whereas nobody can police eBay. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question, Ty. And uh, yeah, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section here or on the live chat or where, wherever it is. I keep pointing the wrong side because the cameras are flipped. <laughs> so yeah, so number one, um, if you're starting off in this hobby, astronomy, I would generally say Dobsonian telescope. Number two, if you're starting with uh, astrophotography, definitely look at getting a star tracker. Three, before you go out and spend a ton of money on like uh, dedicated cameras and filters, et cetera. While that's great when you do want to like level up your skill, take a look and see how far you have to drive for avoiding light pollution. And finally, um, buy used gear as much as you can. Um, unless somebody's like, obviously like, it's hard to not have, sorry. It's easy to inspect gear for quality and you can generally find out in the community, um, especially as you level up in terms of how much gear you're having, if gear is working. Now, I should also mention that your local astronomy store generally will do consignment as well. If you're a little uneasy buying used gear, that's another option. But generally, used gear allows you to save some money um, if you find something that you want and you can find it used. If you can buy it new, that's also good. <laughs> Keeping you know the astronomy hobby alive. And I hope that uh, you've been able to find this live stream useful. Um, <laughs> that's sort of what I had for this thing. I was hoping a few more questions would come in, but uh, 
yeah, uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you probably next week. After I check and see how badly the internet crumpled this video. So, thank you for watching. Thank you, Alex, without an E, and Ty for uh, your comments and questions today. And uh, yeah, I'm going to kill it right now. <laughs>